I'm here again with William Lang with Down River Capital Management. So Billy, why is it you feel investors are being misled with a common wisdom to diversify? Um, well, we still believe that, that not having all your eggs in one basket still makes sense. For instance, on our equity side of our portfolio, we don't run a two-stock portfolio. We typically have anywhere from 25 to 35 holdings. Um, but with that said, the other side of it is, is that a lot of financial planners and even institutional consultants over the years have really preached global diversification. And we feel like the benefits from global diversification are going to be very muted going forward. So what has changed? Well, the world's become so interconnected that um, any, any small, say, actually the, in 2008, when the U.S. You know, housing crisis happened, um, you know, th there was a dramatic impact on Southeast Asia. So because, say, for instance, China, um, over a third of China's exports are, a third of China's GDP is exports. Um, so when the U.S. consumption slowed in 2008, it had a dramatic impact on China and most of Southeast Asia because their economies are so export driven. So if you were globally diversified in 2008, um, say you know you have 50% of your exposures in the U.S., but you have 15% exposure to China and Southeast Asia, you receive very little benefit by being diversified across the globe. And particularly in 2008, it wasn't just Southeast Asia. I mean, it created commodity prices declined by 50%, which if you go to any of the agriculture agricultural economies like Brazil or South America in general, all of those areas declined dramatically as well. So the problem is, is that because the world, because the globe has become so interconnected that the idea of you know, being diversified that when the U.S. goes down that your other areas, your portfolio don't, really no longer holds. For example, if you, if you take what happened in, say, the housing, the housing like California in, in, the, in the mid 80s, actually the late 80s and, and the early 90s, they had their own housing crisis. The difference was is that back in, in that period, the lending was predominantly localized in California. So California's economy you know, it went through an expansion in terms of their economy was doing great. And like what we experienced in 2008, back in the 80s, the banks got very, very easy in terms of their lending standards. So which then, of course, turned into a housing crisis in the 80s and the early 90s in California. The difference being the lending was localized in the California market. That is in stark contrast to what has happened, you know, in 2008 in terms of that the lending was global in terms of with the with the advent of MBS and securitizing mortgages, essentially we went into a global housing crisis. And so the if you were to take the example of California, is, is that let's say you um, owned a house in Spokane in the 80s and you also had a retirement place in California, your house in Spokane wouldn't have moved at all during the housing crisis of California in the 1980s. That, and the reason why we use this as an example, is very representative of what's going on in terms of global finance today. So in summary, what I'm saying is, is that the, the interconnectedness of the global community essentially diffuses a lot of the the benefits that are that are realized from diversification. So even if investors do not have protection from a global standpoint, does it still make sense to diversify across economic sectors? Um, unfortunately, the, the Federal Reserve has put so much liquidity into the system over the last year, they essentially have you know, taken all assets and all boats have risen with the tide. Um, and that's in, that's in stark contrast to most periods. I mean, you could even go back to 2000, um, or actually 1999, when the tech stocks were up, you know, almost 80%. In that period, utilities and healthcare were down around 9%. Um, so if you were a relatively savvy investor in that period and were concerned that the tech stocks were getting a little, a, a, a little rich, that you could have gone into areas that actually had been underperforming and that really provided a tremendous amount of value at that time. You know, coincidentally, in 2000, um, when tech stocks were down 40% after the peak, um, utilities, I believe, were up over 50% and healthcare was up um, approximately 35 or 36% in that year. Does it make sense to diversify across asset classes? Uh, once again, unfortunately, because of what the Fed's done over the last year, um, there, there really aren't, there's really nowhere to hide. Because uh, if you look at if you look at the bond market right now, um, yields are so low because the Fed is 
you know, manipulating, trying to keep interest rates so low to try to stimulate the economy. Um, you know, and that is, the problem is, is that the equity markets have rallied so much. And usually when the economy is doing great and equity markets have gone up tremendously, then no one wants to be in safe stuff in terms of bonds and, and government-backed securities. But, and so the, there really isn't a place to go. And the same, I mean, some of your other asset classes, whether it be, you know, commodities as well. I mean, commodities are at nosebleed levels. Um, so it's a very, very challenging environment to just be an owner because essentially almost all liquid investable assets are inflated. So how do investors protect themselves now that things have changed? Well, in this unique environment that the Fed has created, unfortunately, um, at least in, in our, eye, our view at Downriver, um, really the only way to protect yourself is through both long and short positions. What exactly is a short? I've been asked that question a lot over the years, and it's actually a relatively simple transaction. The easiest way to explain it is, is through an example. So let's say you own uh, 100 shares of XYZ Corporation at $100. Um, and the, the way that I execute the short is I go to you and I essentially ask you if I can borrow your shares at a specific dollar amount. So let's say I'm willing to give you $3 to borrow your shares for the next three months. Um, what I do is, is that right at that time, instantaneously I turn around and sell the stock, XYZ company, the 100 shares at $100 in the marketplace. Um, now, because I'm short, let's, hopefully I'm right, and the stock goes down, let's say, to $60. At that point, three months later, I can go back, purchase the shares at $60, and essentially hand your shares back to you. So my net profit is the $40 that I made minus the $3 that I had to pay you to rent it. So I made $37 on the position. Um, so the idea is to be able to make money when things decline. Now at Downriver, we don't short individual securities. We use ETFs that essentially replicate the same thing that I just explained. Thank you for the information, Billy. Thanks for your time.